on which is on sorry this i'm having a little problem with my uh, this device um, has talk today is on experiences of a bikuni in a western country thank you uh, bikuni subira for giving of your time and your knowledge sharing it with us uh, so over to you bikuni Thank you so much, Professor Zanayaka, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge as well um, the presence of uh, Venerable Olande Ananda, and also um, I think I see Venerable Sailor there too, so paying my respect uh, to the um, Piku Sangha as well. And yeah, lovely, um, lovely to see you all this evening and to join your group for the first time. So what I wanted to share this evening um, is I just have um, a short PowerPoint about some of my experiences um, as a bikini in Australia around living in Sydney. Um, it's, it's not like super scientific. It's just, you know, these are some of the things that I thought would be interesting to share about my day-to-day -day life. Um, so what I'll do, I'll get the PowerPoint up and we can move to the slides. Okay, so select screen, select entire screen, Australian Buddhism slide, that looks like the one, allow. So you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, I'll just go full screen, so hopefully we can get the nice image. Start from first slide. Okay, and it doesn't, oh, maybe it will, maybe it will. I'm going to try one more time to see if it'll do it. Okay, so um, I wanted to share this picture because this picture actually comes from a local park near um, where I live in Sydney. And this is actually from Cabramatta. So Cabramatta is one of our local suburbs, which has a population which is 40% Buddhist um, in Sydney. So the most Buddhist place in Australia. And you can see in this park, we have this public artwork of two monks having a picnic. So I thought that was nice because that's the only example of public Buddhist artwork I know in Australia. Okay, so I'll just keep moving through the slides because I wanted to talk a little bit first about religion in Australia as a whole, um, just to give some background, you know, to how do we, how do we situate Buddhism in Australia um, before I can even start really talking about what does it mean to be a bikini in Australia. Um, so first of all, um, Australia is a liberal democracy, um, which does not have a state religion. And actually the Australian constitution explicitly forbids, you know, setting up a state religion. So already Australia is quite um, different from Sri Lanka in that sense. I understand Sri Lanka, you know, the constitution there, um, it outlines Buddhism as being, um, you know, something that um, the state has a role in protecting. So Christianity is the dominant religion in Australia at 52% overall. So slight, you know, it just tips 50% as being the majority. However, in the territories, um, so Australia has a number of territories like the Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory, um, Christianity is actually under the 50% mark. So, you know, in the 40%, so there are regions of Australia where Christianity doesn't quite make the majority. And we can see some massive um, social changes which have happened here um, in my country, which is Australia, because at the time of federation in 1901, Christianity had actually made up 96% of the population. So all major um, Christian denominations in Australia have 
undergone, um, you know, very massive reductions in affiliation over the past century or so. Um, you know, and why is that? You know, basically it's um, loss of belief. You know, there's been um, a lot of major um, social changes, changing around understanding of science, issues like evolution, um, you know, which have really shaken um, basically the degree to which people actually believe in, in Christianity. So, you know, that's something which is worth remarking on when we think about what, is, what religion in Australia actually is. Um, so religion is not actually that important in Australian life as a whole, with only 33% of people saying that religion is important to them. Um, again, this is, you know, quite different to Sri Lanka. From memory, I think, <laughs> you know, the equivalent statistics for Sri Lanka would be in the high 90s. Um, so, you know, what I've seen, at least um, from what's been written, is that um, this is a major difference between Australia and, um, you know, the Theravada countries in Asia. Um, some studies have ranked Australian youth as the least religious in the world. So, you know, just giving you a picture of um, the general vibe. Um, however, religious organisations play a big role in public life via schools, hospitals and other programs. One quarter of all Australian students are in church affiliated schools and many students in state schools receive religious instruction at school. Um, so we have something called right to access religious education, whereby, um, you know, in government schools, there's half an hour allocated weekly for external groups to come in and teach religious instruction, which in many states now includes Buddhism. Um, I mean, it's a bit contested because not everyone agrees with this system. And in Victoria, you know, recently it's been moved to after hours. Um, but in, in most states in Australia, this still happens during school hours. So Easter and Christmas are public holidays. So the calendar here, you know, it reflects Christianity as being, um, you know, the dominant public religion. So my own story, um, I attended state school initially. So I went to government school up till grade six. I received Christian religious education at government school via that right to access um, religious education. So after year six, I moved to a Christian school, um, a Protestant school, where I also had Christian education at school in addition to chapel. So I received um, 10 years of you know, Christian education via both the government and Christian um, school system. So, um, you know, according to the statistics, that's not that uncommon for Australia. Okay. So we can see on the chart, um, we have these, you know, two, we have the big blue quarter, which is Protestantism in Australia. So my family, um, you know, they're at least culturally Protestant. And we also have this big uh, purple blotch over here, which is Catholicism. So, you know, sometimes I'm surprised when I talk to uh, people from other countries, you know, when they think about Christianity, they think about Catholicism only because that's what they've been exposed to. But actually, <laughs> um, you know, historically in Australia, there's a bit of a gap between, you know, the purple blotch and the blue blotch. Um, you know, we have... Um, both Protestant schools and Catholic schools here. So these, you know, these two things, um, the difference is quite noticeable. Uh, excuse me, the slides, uh, slides are not moving. I don't know. Whether... Oh, the slides aren't moving. That's, that's no good. Okay. So I don't know why. Um, I don't know why that's happening. I'm just going to have a look at the screen sharing. Um, What I'm going to do, I'm going to try sharing 
just from the ordinary display and not from the full screen. Um, but what I was going to say no. is that no, it's now, it should, now it should display. Okay. What I was going to say is that, you know, historically there have been like low scale tensions between these two groups in Australia, but what's happened over time is, you know, there's been an ecumenical movement or, you know, a, a broader pan-Christian movement. And I think these days the, you know, it doesn't matter so much in the cities, at least whether you're Catholic or Protestant, but in the past, this was actually a significant social division in Australia. Um, like in the 60s and stuff. Um, and you, you see like a few other of the slices on the chart. We have quite a number of minority religions in Australia. So um, Buddhism used to be Australia's second largest religion. Um, since 2016, um, that role has been filled by Islam. So Buddhism is now Australia's third largest religion. Um, so you can see according to the chart, Buddhism makes up 2.4% of the Australian population. Um, however, this is overall. In some urban suburbs, um, the Buddhist percentage is higher. So, um, you know, above 5 to 10%. So that doesn't mean, you know, that everywhere is just 2.4% Buddhist. Um, you know, there's some places with more Buddhists, like in the cities. And as you go further inland, the numbers drop off. Um, typically. And, you know, we also see some other significant minority religions like Hinduism. Um, you know, Sikhism isn't on the chart, but, um, you know, there are, we have basically everything here, <laughs> um, you know, most religions. Um, so migration from Asia is primarily responsible um, for the growth of Buddhism in Australia. Um, especially from the 1970s onwards. Um, but, you know, there's also some conversion that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And I think actually, you know, I, I didn't really do this chart justice because, um, you know, if we have a look at this huge white section, the no religion and not stated um, is actually making up this huge chunk of the chart. So um, lack of belief is a significant phenomena in Australia. Um, are we all good? Was someone trying to say something? No. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep moving. Um, so it's actually, it's really difficult to find accurate statistics on conversion to Buddhism in Australia. So some estimates have suggested that converts to Buddhism represent 10% of all Australian Buddhists. Um, if this is correct, there would be about 37,000 converts to Buddhism in Australia. Um, I don't know if you know about paganism, but that's about the same number as the number of pagans. Um, so given the general trends in this area, um, I personally think this is about correct. Um, that, you know, we can of a total Buddhist population of about 370,000 that um, between 10 and 20% of them, you know, they, they didn't originally come from Buddhist backgrounds. Um, so converts from European and other backgrounds contributed to the first wave of Buddhist organisations in Australia from about the 1950s. Um, there had been, you know, there'd been Buddhists in Australia since the 1850s, um, since the Chinese gold rush, etc. Um, but the first wave of institution building really dates from the 1950s onwards. And, you know, there have been Sri Lankans in Australia earlier than that too. Um, in Queensland, I think there may have even been a Bodhi tree that was planted, um, you know, quite early on. That we don't have any institutions that really remain from that period. Um, so the first wave of organisations have state-based names, which include the words Buddhist society. So we have a very famous, um, you know, Buddhist organisation in Australia, which is the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. Um, and, you know, from the name, it tells us that um, this, is a, this is a society that was founded quite early. And the same for the Buddhist Society of Victoria. You know, these um, organisations, they, um, you know, they were um, established by both 
um, migrant Buddhists and new Buddhists who were looking to um, find a way to institutionalize Buddhism in Australia. Um, and I just, you know, I should have um, done my slides a little bit better because, um, you know, this is on my conversion to Buddhism in Australia slide, but also migrants were quite important in those um, early organizations. Um, you know, the ones that were bringing monks from Asia and introducing them to Buddhists locally. Um, but if you look at the photos from this period, you know, quite often the photos will be people wearing suits and, you know, um, quite often there'll be, um, you know, you'll see more Europeans in the photos because this was really before the, like the big migration um, to Australia really started opening up. Um, so I'll keep moving. So all three Buddhist traditions are found in Australia. There's uh, no absolute majority tradition. So we have everything here. Um, we have Theravada, we have Mahayana, we have Vajrayana. So the whole um, smorgasbord, which is good because, you know, it's like you don't need to travel. Um, the whole Buddhist world is literally here. Um, we also have at present a number of umbrella organisations like the Federation of Australian Buddhist Councils, the Australian Sangha Association, as well as Buddhist State Councils, the membership of which is voluntary. And these organisations um, take up particular issues, um, for example, visa issues, and sometimes negotiate with the government um, to try to make sure Buddhists are represented. Um, and another point of difference between Buddhism in Australia and, say, Sri Lanka is that the overall monastic population in Australia is quite low and, you know, only a few hundred maximum. So that's a, um, you know, that's a substantial point of difference because the scale of the, you know, of the monastic population is just um, so tiny here <laughs> um, compared to anything in a Theravada country. And I just had this picture as well too, because um, I should have actually had a dedicated slide, you know, on migration. But this picture comes from my hometown, which is Brisbane. And just commenting on some of the impacts of migration on Australian Buddhism. So obviously, um, you know, after the Vietnam War, um, Australia, Australia took in a lot of uh, refugees from Vietnam um, and also from countries like um, Laos and Cambodia, which had their own internal um, conflicts. Um, and, you know, later from Sri Lanka too, we have very large um, overseas um, Sri Lankan populations in Australia. So um, Melbourne having the largest Sri Lankan population outside of Sri Lanka. So um, in the photo, you can see um, something very, very Australian, very Australian Buddhist, which is um, the Sri Lankan temple from my hometown, which is Lankaramia, and the Kwan Arm statue um, at the temple, which was given by the Vietnamese community. So um, just showing you know, how we have multiple ethnic communities here, um, sometimes, you know, cooperating with each other, sometimes later getting their own organisations. Um, but we have a, um, you know, this wonderful multi-ethnic, um, you know, Buddhist community where there's lots of different uh, things happening. Um, so I wanted to give an example of a large monastery in Australia again, which is not like a large monastery in Asia, there's just like this huge difference in terms of the size. So the example I wanted to give um, was Bodhinyana Monastery and Damasara from Western Australia, which is Ajahn Brahm's monastery. And as far as I know, this is the largest monastery in Australia in terms of numbers. So um, to the best of my knowledge, they have just under 30 monks and under 20 nuns although the numbers are restricted by immigration constraints. Um, so you have, you know, a photo there that's from my bikini ordination, um, you know, showing what, you know, a developed and larger monastic community looks like in Australia. 
you know, most monasteries here aren't like that. Um, you know, it's, it's more typical to have, um, you know, a relatively um, smaller centre with maybe like up to four or five monastics, you know, some of whom may be going back to Asia regularly. And if I had more time, I would have shown you as well, um, you know, some pictures of maybe some of the large um, Vietnamese monasteries because, you know, there are monasteries like, say, Quang, Quang Ming Monastery in Melbourne where on a weekend they can get up to 2,000 people. So um, you have these, like, major communities and, say, you know, another example of a very large monastery might be um, Nantian Temple from Wollongong, where you know, in, an international organization like Phu Wang Shan has really poured in a lot of money, you know, to build the very big um, center. And, you know, there's also very large um, Tibetan Buddhist centers in Australia as well. So like I said, we have everything here. You know, there's no one school that's really managed, um, you know, to become dominant. Um, so I just wanted to show again um, something from my local area, um, you know, talking about migration as well. Like I mentioned, um, my local area, I'm in the vicinity of Cabramatta, which has a Buddhist population of 40%. So that's the picture of the Cabramatta street. You know, you can see the Vietnamese restaurants and things. Um, so Cabramatta is mostly Vietnamese, but also Lao, Cambodian and Thai, um, many originally refugees. Um, so there are many temples in the local area which serve ethnic communities. Um, and that's a picture of um, us on arms down in Cabramatta. Um, and it's normally way busier than that. I don't know why there are no people in that photo. Um, you know, normally that, that area is packed. Um, so that day we went, that's Bante Sujato in the front, you know, two um, Burmese monks. And that's me and um, another seminary. So that was... Um, you know, something nice that we did in the local Buddhist suburb, you know, just going and arms around. Um, but, you know, Cabramatta being very famous in Australia as being, you know, one of Australia's big um, migration stories. Okay, so you can see that this is the Sydney map about, like, where Buddhists actually live in Sydney. So you can see these darker areas, um, Cabramatta being the Vietnamese hub around that, having like these Lao Cambodian kind of centers as well. So I'm just up on the northern edge of that green strip. Um, my exact suburb is actually an Iraqi and a Syrian enclave. Um, so the people I live around, I live slightly to the north and they're mostly Middle East and Christian. And, you know, there's various reasons why they've chosen to leave the Middle East. You know, some left um, because, you know, of the, uh, like, religious discrimination or because of, um, um, you know, persecution or things like that. So in my local area, um, most people don't speak English at home. Languages spoken include um, Assyrian, Arabic and Vietnamese. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's where I live. I, I live um, in this lovely little Middle Eastern place. But I find it a little bit of a barrier sometimes because, um, you know, I, I just don't speak Arabic. And, um, you know, that's about <laughs> the end of the story. If there's, you know, sometimes people have like kids or like if they're traveling in a group, Sometimes there'll be one person in the group who can speak better English and can help interpret for me. Um, but, you know, it is a bit of a barrier to actually engaging people. Um, yeah, so, like, on, when I first came here, I didn't know what language people spoke. And I actually, I struggled a little because I didn't know any Vietnamese either. And I actually had to get one of our supporters to write me out um, this little note sheet with all of these Vietnamese phrases 
So my note sheet said, you know, my name is Aya Suvira. I'm from Meturama in Vietnamese. Um, you know, my monastery has a Vietnamese name as well. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I had to explain to them, you know, I, I, take, I take food, I, I don't take money. And now that I have my little cheat sheet, um, things have gotten a lot easier because I can explain, you know, to the, to the elderly people, um, you know, what I'm doing, um, why I'm an armchair, what my name is. So, um, I so, yeah, in terms of, like, um, religiosity in Australia as a whole, like this whole Western Sydney area, um, it has its own demographics. So this is actually like a, a pretty religious place to live in general. Um, but moving, moving on. So um, in terms of where I live, I live at a place called Metarama, which is a Buddhist nuns monastery in Western Sydney, which was established in 2018 to meet the growing needs of the Kunis in Sydney. Um, you know, it's currently in the process of incorporation with an expanding support base in the local community. Mm. Um, so it's a new place, but it's, you know, hopefully moving forward. And I just wanted to share a little bit about the type of Buddhism that I um, was raised in, um, so to say. So um, my teacher's teacher was Ajahn Chah, who was originally from the northeast of Thailand. So um, Ajahn Brahm's teacher was Ajahn Chah. And indirectly, you know, also um, Bhante Sujato was um, ordained at Wat Pananachat as well. So um, the way this has evolved in Australia, you know, it's a tradition that is based on the sutta and on the vinya. So some of the distinctive characteristics include um, no money or personal property ownership. So there's an emphasis on meditation and seclusion over academia and social work. Um, however, you know, the way that this tradition has evolved in Australia is a bit different to how it's been actualized in Thailand because one of the um, big difficulties actually, you know, for Westerners to engage with Thai Buddhism was that, you know, Western ladies, yeah, yeah. they were trying to Thailand to get ordained as, as Mechis, but they were finding that the system wasn't really supportive for them, you know, and it couldn't really match their expectations in terms of what they um, needed from Buddhism because it um, sometimes the roles that were available, um, you know, these, um, these ladies from like Malaysia or the West, they wanted to go to Thailand to meditate. And what they were finding was that, you know, the role they were being put in um, was actually, um, you know, um, sometimes more focused around supporting monks rather than their own meditation practice. And for whatever Sorry. reason, um, this northeastern region of Thailand, um, you know, it's never been known as a Meiji center. Most of the Meiji monasteries in Thailand are actually in the south. So... Um, you know, this tradition has, has really gone through an evolution whereby, um, you know, higher ordination has been made available. And now, um, you know, many vineyard based monasteries for the Kunis um, are in the West. So, you know, if you're looking for a place as a Bikuni where you, where you don't handle money and, you know, where you are keeping a more strictly vineyard based practice, um, you know, uh, there's a... Um, a lot of options in, in Western countries. Um, so some of the basic characteristics of this tradition are intimacy, so that's a fancy word that means wandering, and arms um, mendicancy. mendicancy. So, you know, sometimes um, when we think of what a monk is, like sometimes we may even use the word priest, you know, to indicate someone who's conducting the pujas at the temple, you know, someone who's a learned person, but actually... Um, that doesn't necessarily capture what the word bhikkhu or bhikkhuni means because we have this term mendicancy, which means, you know, going for arms, uh, you know, um, not having a fixed residence, um, having a very simple life. Really? So 
what this Thai forest tradition was aiming to do was to capture some of those, you know, more original values. Um, you know, another feature of this um, forest tradition was that it has minimal rituals. So, you know, some people, even they visit Wat Pa Nanachat in Thailand and they think, oh, this is like a summer camp. You know, it's not like a, a temple because it's not ornamental enough. So a very uh, simple mode of life. So because of some of the early Western monks who went to Thailand, um, this form of Buddhism has become quite popular in the West. So that's, um, for me, that was my entry gate into Buddhism. But because we also have substantial Sri Lankan migrant communities here, I've also had significant exposure, um, you know, to other types of international Buddhism and to the Sri Lankan community as well. Um, so, you know, another feature of this tradition is the requirement of uh, what's called nisya, or um, yeah, taking dependency where you, um, you know, you commit to training under a teacher um, for a certain period of time before going wandering. So, yeah, so that's, um, that's just something I wanted to share. Everybody to mute their mics, please, because it's disturbing Bikuni. Please mute your okay. mic. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. It is a little bit distracting. Um, but that's okay. We'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, like nice picture of Ajahn Chah there. So, you know, we, we do, we have a tradition that, you know, came from Asia, um, but some of the features of that tradition were very difficult to make work in the West. And I'd say for women in particular, um, this tradition didn't really offer a lot for them um, in its original form. Um, you know, and that was even true even in Thailand, um, just because of the particular characteristics of, you know, Northeast Thai culture. It's just never been a place that's been famous for nuns. Okay. Um, so a little bit about like what we do here at um, Metarama. So, um, you know, in my day I do meditation. I do a little bit of monastery admin, um, teaching and planning programs. We have a monthly Uposita day, a.k.a. Poya day, and Sutta discussion program. We have a Waisak public program. Um, I also undertake Sutta central translation work, um, a little bit of specialist Buddhist linguistic work um, that I don't really want to go into because, um, you know, I'd have to introduce you to maybe like languages you've never heard of before because um, I'm part of a reading group that reads um, Gandhari language texts so if you have an interest um, you know you can google what Gandhari is in your spare time but it's basically um, an ancient um, an ancient language from the region that's now Afghanistan and Pakistan um, so you know some of these um, very early um, Buddhist texts were actually written in on birch bark in this Gandhari language so I do a little bit of specialised linguistic work where, I, where I've committed to actually um, learning Gandhari language. Okay. Um, and I also do the Ask a Buddhist program where I answer queries from newcomers to Buddhism by email. And I also teach um, by the Metta Centre. So, you know, that's one of the ways we engage the community. Um, and it's nice because actually sometimes via the Metta Center, you know, you do get people from non-traditional Buddhist backgrounds. Like sometimes you see people who might have like Turkish names or um, whose background might be like even Pacific Islander or, um, you know, just really, really multicultural. And I, I love it because, you know, it brings just so much um, different perspectives into what you're doing. So that's one of the things I just, I really love about Western Sydney is the diversity. Okay, um, so about our community. So our nuns residence is supported by um, local interstate and international donors. Um, many of the monastery functions are supported by the Metarama Working Group as well as the Meta Centre. Um, so we're a new organisation and we rent the premises 
And this is a really common way for Buddhist organizations to start in Australia. So that's just where we are in our journey. But I wanted to mention it too, because um, Australian Buddhism, because it's, it's new, um, you know, sure there are organizations that have been around since the 50s, but there's still a lot of institution building that's happening or needs to happen. So like some of my first memories of attending temple, you know, were, you know, sitting in meditation and having the construction work going on because there's just always, you know, someone's always building something because there's just so much need um, because there was, you know, just nothing there previously. Okay, um, so a little bit more about um, my life in Western Sydney. So um, I go on daily arms round here, um, which is nice because there are people there. It's nice and safe. Um, so my donors are Middle Eastern, Asian, and Caucasian. So I get to eat Vietnamese, um, Assyrian slash Iraqi and Western food. Um, Australia is a really great place to do arms round. You can get arms basically anywhere here. Um, I have actually tried this at various rural locations, um, like just places where people would think like you can't get arms there. And um, like most of the time you can. There's only ever been one time I haven't received arms in Australia. And that was because I left too late. I think I would have left like about 11 o'clock or something. And that was my own fault for just not being organized. Um, but one of the differences here is that, you know, when you go on arms round here, quite often you get bread. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for rice, you have to really, you'd have to really go to the Thai restaurants or something. Um, you know, bread is my most common staple. And, you know, sometimes the Middle Eastern shop owners give me like falafel or things like these Middle Eastern dishes. Um, so just, you know, really on that basic level, um, obviously, you know, I live in the West, but I'm still a bikini. You know, I, I depend on my bowl and my robes to live um, just like anyone else would. Um, but I mean, this is maybe this is a little bit typical for the Thai tradition as well, because because Thailand has a relatively strong uh, pindapada or arms round culture. And I'm not 100% certain on this, but I think the reason for that historically was that um, at a point in Thai history, it was actually compulsory for monks to go on pindapada. So that may be why um, you know, Thailand um, has preserved this custom relatively well. And you know, part of that too may also be the influence of the Thai forest tradition um, in the West because my exposure has largely been to monks trained in that tradition. Um, you know, fast is quite a normal thing to, um, to be going on arms round. So I have just some more pictures there from, from Cabramatta. When I, when I first came here, I did accept meals, but I found it was a little bit inconvenient because, um, you know, we're just in the rented house. So people had to really come inside to do the meal offering. And by the time people came in, you know, we talked to them and do the chanting. It was quite a long time already. So this way I just go and I'm very free as to when I, I go and come back. So it's quite easy. Um, so next, next slide. Okay. Um, so one thing about where I live is that Western Sydney is a heat bowl. So it is very hot. Um, there's no breeze in summer. So the breeze stops, um, you know, like closer to the sea. So you have like this kind of like this built up urban area that just really traps heat. Oh. And I have to actually walk um, about a kilometre to the shops to get arms. So I tried doing that once in, in my long sleeve jacket. And it nearly made me quite sick, actually, because, um, you know, I just, I really overheated. Mm. So I don't actually um, wear the long sleeve jacket anymore because you just can't in, the, in this type of weather here. Um, you know, I have to wear the original style, which is much um, more convenient. So, you know, as monastics, we rely just on, um, for bikinis, on five robes. 
And I couldn't find a like ready-made picture of the Bikini's five robes. But, you know, this is just an example. The Bikini's have two extra, which are the Sanka Chika, which is the nun's uh, shoulder cover, which leaves the right-hand shoulder exposed. And we also have um, a bathing cloth. So a few, a few more pieces than the monks. And it may seem like a relatively trivial point, uh, but, but when you actually have to live um, in a place that's as hot as Western Sydney, you know, if I had to actually wear a long sleeve blouse every day, um, I would actually make myself very sick. Yeah. So I feel, you know, if I can explain this to as many people as possible, people will be more sympathetic to me to understand why I, um, why I live the way I live. And, you know, I also, I, I did actually seek um, senior level Vinaya advice about that. So I do actually have permission from my Vinaya teacher. You know, just wear the original style. Um, so moving on. So some, this is um, getting towards the end of things. So I figure I'll talk through until um, 10 p.m. our time and then um, give it back to um, Minori. But some things that I like about Buddhism in Australia. So I do like the presence of vineyard based and forest traditions in Australia because it um, means, you know, there's a lot of um, support there if you choose um, not to use money. So um, that's not the case everywhere and especially not for nuns. So that's something I'm just um, incredibly grateful for. You know, um, like not everyone understands it because not everyone's been exposed to it yet. But once people are exposed to it and they understand, actually, you know, we have to give the money via the monastery account and not to the monk or nun personally, um, normally they can understand quite quickly. Clean and safe the road. Um, so another thing I, I like is that um, there are pathways for bhikkhunis to ordain locally now via Dhammasara. So if I if I would have had to have gone to Sri Lanka to ordain, that would have been quite inconvenient for me because, you know, I wouldn't have known the country, I wouldn't have known the food or the people. <laughs> um, you know, as a as a you know, I'm a young person from the country, I wouldn't have known really um, how to manage visas or things like that. So the fact I could ordain um, in Australia was a really huge benefit because it meant I didn't have to negotiate any of that stuff. So in the past, you know, that's what people had to do. You know, if you wanted to ordain, you had to go to Asia. The way, um, so money, opportunity for Bikunis to ordain. Yeah. Local. So um, again, Hi. if I could just ask people to mute, um, it is a little bit distracting for me to have to talk um, over the background noise. So that would that would help me out. Okay, so um, again, some things I really like about Buddhism in Australia, I like um, that there's really good meditation teachers here and I do like that we have access to sutta-based Buddhism. Um, you know, if you want to learn Abhidharma in Australia, you can. If you want to learn sutta in Australia, you can too, which um, I think is really wonderful. Um, but, you know, I, I went down a more sutta-based pathway. So... Um, Something I really, really like about Australia is Medicare. So we do have free public health care that covers, um, you know, a percentage of specialist and hospital costs and sometimes up to 100% of GP costs. Um, so it's a huge benefit if you're a monastic. And that's, you know, Medicare is the number one reason why a lot of Australian monks and nuns don't just move to Asia because, you know, people ultimately, they want to be coming back to Australia a lot of the time to be able to retain Medicare. Um, so, you know, some of the monastics, I know they have a arrangement where they're in like Sri Lanka for part of the year or part of the time, but they are still having, you know, a long-term plan to come back to Australia. Um, I, I'm talking mainly about the ones who are Australian citizens. I mean, there's other ways of doing it, just, just commenting on the fact that, you know, these type of concerns, um, they, they make a huge difference. Um, so another thing I really like about Australia is that um, the strong legal system and land ownership system makes it easy to run associations in Australia. 
Um, so, you know, it's like not all Buddhist countries, you know, have great um, situations around things like land ownership. Like, you know, if you were to compare like actually owning something in say Cambodia and Australia, um, <laughs> you know, it's just, there's just no comparison that, you know, the system here is very stable. Um, so Australia is, um, you know, for the most part, it's a relatively safe country. There's clean air and safer roads. You know, um, people here, they're not getting like, you know, diseases from breathing the air. Um, so again, a huge benefit. And the presence of significant Buddhist minorities just makes life easier. So, you know, I'm not actually dealing with people who are new to Buddhism 100% of the time. Um, you know, a lot of the people here, um, a lot of the English speakers, they're, they're learning about Buddhism for the first time. But the fact that we do have migrants from places like Sri Lanka and Thailand, um, it, it really helps because, you know, there are people there who, um, who have a background, who know what they're doing, um, who can also help to support the, the newcomers to Buddhism. So I, I just feel continuously grateful for, um, you know, the wonderful ethnic communities we have here. Um, so big smile. We also do not have an ID card system or state Buddhism, which makes life easy in many ways. And bhikkhuni ordination is already the most popular ordination type for Theravada nuns in Australia. Um, I don't have official stats on this, but I'm 100% I'm certain that most Theravada nuns in Australia have bhikkhuni ordination. Um, so the overall positive environment can make up for being a religious minority. So when I traveled in Thailand, for example, um, I really felt at home and I really felt like people understood me there, like I had a role in society. Um, and it was a very different feeling to being in Australia. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there are a lot of other advantages to living here. So, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. It's not like the be all and end all of things that could be said about Australian Buddhism. But I think, you know, these are observations that many people could, could make. Okay, so things I don't like about Buddhism in Australia. Um, so this may not be the most obvious thing, but I do not like the extreme heat in Western Sydney. And, you know, when I think about things like climate change, we had an issue here, like earlier in the year when the bats, the bats in the trees were literally dying because of the heat and they're dropping out of the heat because they're dropping out of the trees because they're dying because of climate change. And, you know, when you have that type of like just continuous heat, it makes it really um, hard to focus. So that's, um, maybe that's not something I don't like about Buddhism in Australia. That's just something that makes life concerning in, in general. So another thing I don't like about Buddhism in Australia is um, inconsistent action or lack of action on improving conditions for nuns. Um, many nuns still live in invisible housing arrangements outside of the monastery system, um, sometimes in menial or invisible roles. So outside of the large monasteries, um, I understand we have similar um, issues to what might exist in Asia where they're just, um, you know, there's not actually proper support systems for nuns and sometimes, you know, monastery committees, they're not very um, active in trying to um, improve things because, you know, kind of sometimes there can be this habit or perception, you know, that the monks need the community support but the nuns just have to fend for themselves. So... Um, we have a couple of large nuns monasteries, but outside of that, um, things are still um, hit and miss. And, you know, sometimes even within the, the mainstream organizations, um, <laughs> you know, it can be really quite inconsistent sometimes as to the type of, um, you know, support that's actually available there for nuns, particularly for the um, Theravada and Tibetan traditions. So another thing that's a bit um, problematic is relative underinvestment in nuns. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Just for whatever reason, um, 
you know, communities um, have focused on bringing the monks in and building the monks' monasteries. And there hasn't really necessarily been the same level of attention given um, to supporting nuns. Um, and, you know, this is outside of those, um, the main big nuns' monasteries. So monks brought in from overseas can sometimes bring biases from their home countries. So, you know, even though I might have monks here that I know locally and who I can work with, you know, when, um, when new monks come in from overseas, um, I don't necessarily have a pre-existing relationship with them. And, you know, I can work as hard as I, uh, I can in the local community, but um, when people are coming in and out all the time, it makes it really hard to, to build connections that, you know, would be more meaningful and, you know, let me actually talk to people in the community. So that's just, um, you know, that is what it is. That's just something about um, the local environment. Um, you know, sometimes lack of English prevents some monastics from engaging the wider community. You know, there's a lot of resources in the Australian Buddhist community, <laughs> but not necessarily a lot of English. So, um, again, you know, being an English-speaking monastic, um, it is, you know, um, you know, sometimes I end up picking up that work, which is fine. But, you know, if, if, um, if the monks and nuns don't speak English, what's going to happen is that the kids of all of the migrants you know, their Sinhalese isn't going to be so good, their Thai isn't going to be so good, their Lao isn't going to be so good. Um, they're not going to actually be able to talk to the monks at the temple and, you know, to get a proper Buddhist education. So I'd say this is an, um, an ongoing issue as well. And another thing I don't really like about Buddhism in Australia um, is being a minority religion. This is just in general. So there's not really a widespread cultural understanding of Buddhism. Um, you know, a lot of Westerners have a positive impression of Buddhism, but, you know, there are also negative impressions too, and it just, um, it can be a little bit hit and miss sometimes. So um, that's very much, you know, compared to a place like Thailand where, um, where you know, everyone instantly understands um, who you are and what you're doing. I'm just using Thailand as an example because I've actually been to Thailand. I haven't been to Sri Lanka. Okay, so, so thinking about the future. So Theravada Bikini groups are currently undergoing rapid growth and the generally free environment in Australia and the ready availability of arms means that it is a good place for nuns to live, um, in my opinion. Um, as long as Buddhists themselves don't ruin the opportunity, by forcing nuns into inappropriate and invisible roles, Australia can be a heaven for nuns. Um, so, you know, the best way to help nuns is really to support them directly materially and, you know, to also um, <laughs> encourage nuns in more visible roles. Um, and that includes speaking roles where nuns, you know, get a chance to use their voice and to explain their own lives and own issues. Um, and I have a note there that invisibility equals death. Um, and this is just, for me personally, um, you know, I've seen a lot of nuns in, in roles where they do a lot of work, but they don't necessarily have a public community voice where they can explain, you know, actually this is what I need. Um, this is my own experience of the community here. And, you know, there's this problem of invisibility um, it ties back into the lack of material support because, you know, when nuns are invisible, um, you know, their, their issues aren't raised and then not addressed. So on, ongoing community education is still needed to develop and protect strong local cultures in the face of international pressures and negative biases. So, you know, on the whole, um, local attitudes towards nuns um, are relatively positive. So I feel what we should be doing is actually protecting and nourishing our local cultures um, where we do have a very strong Bakuna community. Um, so obviously, you know, it's the choice of individual organisations what path they want to go down. Um, 
that that's, um, you know, my own experience that we do have something that's quite um, wonderful here. And, you know, we should be, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be afraid of saying, <laughs> this is our community, this is how it works here. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, we have a long history of actually supporting the CUNYs. So um, that's my presentation for today. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just um, a lot of my, uh, you know, personal um, experience um, and, you know, sometimes opinions. So um, I'll hand back to um, Professor um, thank Minori. You. Thank, thank you, Bikuni. That was an amazing uh, presentation to us.